Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, uh, we've got a very interesting show today. I think people are going to really enjoy it. We're calling it Poetry, a Creative Tool for Healing. For all of you who like to write, who are interested in poetry, this is going to be a wonderful show. So uh, do you want to introduce our guest, Heidi? Sure. Our guest today is Mike Bernhardt. He is a widower, and he is the editor of Voices of the Grieving Heart, an anthology of poetry about grieving the death of people we loved. This book has 83 contributors from all over the world who have shared their journey through loss, grief, transformation, and healing. Welcome to our show, Mike. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to have you on. Now, as I understand it, you got started with this after the death of your wife? Right. So she died in 1991, um, unexpectedly. I was 34 at the time. She was 31. Wow. And um, so, I mean, as you can imagine, it was a it was devastating for me. We've been married seven and a half years and she was full of life and, you know, all of that. Um, and um, I just found myself compelled to write poetry. Now, um, had you done that before? I had done it a little bit um, as a teenager during times of great distress. Um, and, um, but not all the time. I didn't consider myself a poet at all. I, I did journal but I wasn't writing poetry. Um, and it just kind of came out of me. It was the only way that I could really express myself uh, and kind of see myself, I, I think is one way to put it, um, to just be able to let out what was there, you know? And she died very suddenly. I, I know people are gonna to wanna to know what she, what, how did she die? Yeah, well, she, she was born with a serious congenital heart condition. Um, she was someone who her parents were always told she wasn't going to live, but she did. And she grew up and, and uh, went to college and had a happy life and met me and had a happier life. <laughs> but um, yeah, basically her heart ran out of time is essentially what happened. But it was, it was not expected at that in the way and with, with the speed in which it happened. So. Yeah. Mike was really young and it sounds like poetry was the way that you really began to heal. It, it was. It, um, I mean, I did a lot of things. I went to a grief support group uh, weekly. It was a drop-in group um, where you could just go and talk about what was going on with you or just listen if you didn't want to talk, um, which I found remarkable uh, to just be able to listen to people um, and hear their stories and, you know, see myself in them. And, and that's kind of what this, the poetry in this book does for, did for me and seems to do for other people is just, you can find yourself in other people's words. Right. Well, lovely. I know uh, we talked earlier about you uh, starting out. I'd love to hear a reading from you from the book that you did in that first year that you wrote. Sure. This was probably a couple of months after um, my wife died. And um, I'll just read it. It's, it's short. It's called Scream at the Ocean. The ocean waves pile up on one another, rolling forward relentlessly, smashing onto the beach. And eyes wide open, powerful in rage, I scream with all my might. But the surf drowns my voice. I cannot bring her back. How did you get into having other people send you their poetry? And... Well, um, it, it kind of gets to something that I said a little bit ago. I, I've been going to this grief support group and I've been writing my own poetry and I wanted to read poetry by other people that spoke to me. Um, but I didn't really find anything out there. 
um, I, I, I was looking for anthologies or whatever, and just there were some, but they tended to be um, early 20th century, 19th century poetry, you know, stuff that was out of copyright. And it, it just didn't mean that much to me. It was too stylized. And so I set out to find poetry that was meaningful. And so I, uh, at the time, it was long before the internet. Well, I guess at the birth of the internet, but um, I put out a call for submissions to uh, compassionate friends, um, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Center. And this was basically just advertising in their newsletters, their paper newsletters that I was looking for poetry. Um, I expected to get a few things. I was thinking about putting them together in some sort of a collection. And I received over 200 poems from multiple countries. I was really amazed. And they were just wonderful. And, and I received letters with them um, sometimes. I mean, there, were, there was more than one person who said I was the first person they'd ever shared their poem with. Oh. Um, another person said that um, they'd been writing and they were seeing a therapist. They'd been struggling with the death of their father when they were a child. And, um, you know, they said their therapist thought that, uh, that they should send this to me, that they thought it might be good for them to share it. Um, <laughs> and so out of those, the original edition, out of those 200 or so poems, I selected 65. Seven of them were mine. Um, those same seven are in this book, which is twice as big. I didn't add any more of my own. Um, so that, that's really how it happened. Um, it, it was really, it, it was for me to heal that I wanted to read these poems, um, but it turned out that it was really helpful for the contributors too. Um, that community. Have you got yeah. another one in there that you particularly like that you'd like to read to us? Some of the poems are intense, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, I'll just share this one because, um, you know, suicide is such a huge issue. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of poems in here about suicide. So this, this one is, it can be hard to hear, but I think people who've lost someone to suicide, I think will probably feel it. <clears throat> it's called, How So? Doing fine, he always said. He phoned each week, just like you should on Sunday around eight. He never forgot like some. Teaching at the college, proud. Oh yes, I was proud. I showed pictures of the children, one named after me. She has his smile and mine. Clean bill of health, not broke or stoned or out of gas. Took care of his, his own just fine and even sent me violets on my birthday. How so? I cringe and shiver, slumped into that spidery corner, heart dripping blackest blood beside me, mother of a suicide. Wow, yeah. That is powerful. It's, it's powerful. Yeah. I always choke up when I read these poems. I mean, that one's from 1992 or something when I first received it. And I still choke up when I read it. It's yeah. Now, have you noticed that your poetry has changed? One of the things that's changed for me is at the time, I, I had to be in pain a lot in order to write. You felt like you could access those feelings when you were in pain? or. Yeah, I think it's because they came up to the surface more easily. There's the Spanish concept of duende, which is kind of like this spirit of this kind of dark spirit that comes up and fills, let's say, a flamenco dancer or a poet that they just, they have to create. Um, it's, it's like almost driven. And that's how it was for me then. Um, and what I found now is that I can kind of um, almost choose to bring it up and then put it away. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I couldn't put it away. It was completely in control. It, it, uh, when it was there, it was there. Mm -hmm. um, That's kind of interesting. And, and when you're talking about it right now, um, I, I kind of feel sometimes that you wish you had that intensity. At time. Do you ever feel that way, that you miss that kind of intensity? I do miss that intensity sometimes. In fact, I did, I wrote an essay that had to do with Duende uh, that that's exactly what I said is that I, I started to miss the intensity of it. There was a joy for me almost. I mean, I think only 
people who understand grief can understand what I'm saying, but it was almost a joyous experience because I felt so deeply, I felt so alive, even though it wasn't pleasant, right. but it was rich and wonderful. And as things settled down, as I kind of moved through my grieving process, it, I, I missed that. It was, I felt not exactly numb, but not as alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think that that's one thing that, uh, that doesn't come up a lot about grief and loss is that there is a certain uh, energy about yeah. getting back to that area, which I think sometimes people can hold on to that a bit. Right, because because like Mike said, the, the pain and the intensity and the adrenaline of it all makes you feel feel very deeply and feel very alive. You can feel everything. Yeah. So, and <clears throat> the, the other part is hard. It's hard when you're numb and you know in that space. What's been wonderful about doing this second edition, I, I started it last fall, you know, with the height of the pandemic, just because of all the grieving going on, I wanted to re-release the book. And I thought I would look for a few poems that may be related to the pandemic in some way, just to kind of make it a little more current. And so I put out um, a call for submissions through John Fox's organization, the Institute for Poetic Medicine. And um, again, I received like 200 submissions, wow. um, this time mostly from write, people who already were writing poetry. I have a chapter called Pandemic that's got 17 poems in it. Um, but in total, instead of 65 poems, I've got over 130 now. Going through them, it was that same experience we've just discussed because I just kind of immersed myself mm -hmm. in, in grief, but it was of my choosing, which made it mm -hmm. certainly easier than the first time around to just be able to sit and feel um, the, the beauty of the poems that people sent me, you know, about their pain or their joy or they're um, beginning to heal. Has there been anything over the last 30 years that has surprised you about your grief journey? Actually, what, what surprised me is, is um, one of the things I did for the book was I, I went back to some of the original contributors and um, I asked them that question. Um, huh? what, what, has, what is your grief like for you now, 20 something years later? What surprised me as I read those was that my own grief journey is a bit different than most. <laughs> um, in that, I think because of my age, um, I remarried two years later, we're still married. We started a family and all of that stuff. I couldn't have children with my first wife because of her heart condition. Um, so when I, I would have told you that I healed, um, but most, people who contributed to the first book wouldn't put it that way. Um, and so I think I, because I sort of, I, I moved on and yet I didn't. I mean, I moved on. I know in Soaring Spirits, uh, my friend said they, they like to say moved with, not moved on. Um, and I think it is a much more accurate description. Um, I took Susan with me. I just didn't quite realize how much I took her along until I started working on this book. Um, and so, you know, she's, she's right there for me now, but in a very different way than in the early nineties. Um, but for many of the people, especially people who've lost children, um, there's no, there's certainly no moving on and there's sometimes a moving with, um, people had other children, but, um, you know, they still miss the one who died. Um, I like that moving with. I, think I do it's too. A wonderful way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we do take, I take my brother with me throughout life. And we really, and when we, and like you said, Mike, when we really think about it and sit and reflect on it, we really realize how much we've continued our bonds with people and how much we take them with us. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. Uh, people that are that close in our lives change our personalities in different ways that, with, that we don't even know. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell us about where people can get your book. There are seven poems of my own, but there's uh, 130 something um, poems and essays total in here. 
Um, people can buy it anywhere. You can find it on Amazon. You can order it from your local bookstore if you want. My website is mikebernhardt.net, N-E-T. And um, <clears throat> there's also a page there that's got several links to order the book from various places. I've got some of the contributors are making videos of themselves reading their own poems from the book. Oh, I love them. Yeah, so if you go to mikebernhardt.net slash poems, um, there's a few of them there now. And would really, I, I'm really enjoying that. It's just great to hear people read their own poetry rather than just reading it on the page. Thank you so much for being on the show and, and for this wonderful work you've done. Well, thank yeah. you very much for having me here. Thanks, Mike. And thank you for giving so many people a voice, a voice through their own poetry so that they could show us how they found hope and meaning after loss. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us on the show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.